Simpson Grierson promoted Bronwyn Heenan to employment partner in its Wellington office in the last year. Bronwyn joins me now to talk about some recent employment law issues that have caught her eye. Bronwyn, thanks for taking the time. Let's kick off with Andrews versus the Chief Executive of the IRD. What exactly happened in this case? Well, this was a case uh, where Ms Andrews was given a final written warning uh, by the IRD uh, for improper access um, of taxpayers' information. Uh, and uh, when it went through the Employment Relations Authority because she did not think the warning was justified, the authority agreed with her uh, and removed the warning from her file, but also importantly awarded her $20,000 in hurt and humiliation compensation for unjustified disadvantage. Uh, so um, a significant sum of money. What, what exactly is unjustified disadvantage? Unjustified disadvantage is a claim that you raise whilst you're still an employee. So you raise a claim that you've been unjustifiably disadvantaged in your employment. And one of the things you can be unjustifiably disadvantaged in relation to is receiving a written warning, or in this case a final written warning, uh, where, that, where that written warning is unjustified. Uh, and so on the facts, uh, the authority decided the warning was unjustified, uh, and that was why she was awarded $20,000 compensation. I think the authority also found some procedural issues in terms of IRD's disciplinary pr process. What exactly would, did it, they do wrong there? It did find some procedural issues, and of course, you know, IRD has um, great ways of protecting client information because it obviously has very sensitive mm. information. And the issue here was whether or not Miss Andrews uh, had improperly or unjustifiably accessed sensitive uh, client taxpayer information. She had been asked to do a form of quality checking of a peer's work, and so she was entitled to go and look at this particular person's information but the concern was from the IRD that she went too far and they were concerned that she did that because this person was a prominent or famous New Zealander, we of course never got to find out who that was, uh, but a prominent or famous New Zealander um, in a profession that everyone would know about and what she had done after she'd accessed this information is she had gone to a meeting with colleagues and told them that you know she'd been nosy uh, and those, that was the language that she used uh, and she talked about this prominent person and their earnings and so some colleagues had actually raised uh, the concerns that perhaps she had improperly accessed uh, this information. The difficulty for IRD and the trouble that it ran into was it went through a disciplinary process which it was absolutely entitled uh, to do, but she said, this is how I would normally go into a taxpayer's record. So she went 2021, 2022, uh, 20, uh, 2020, but she went way back beyond that to 2016 and 2017. Uh, and the IRD said, you've got no reason to have really gone that far back. And she said, well, my usual practice would be to do that and the problem was and where the, where the authority said IRD one of the reasons they fell down was they didn't actually look into that properly they didn't do a good deep dive to see whether or not she was telling the truth so the difficulty was we'll never know whether or not she improperly accessed those accounts or not because the IRD didn't look into it fulsomely enough for the authority's satisfaction uh, and so on the basis of that procedural defect and there were also a couple of others in relation to the provision of information it was held to be unjustified. So this is really a case of uh, the procedure. We always say the procedure is as important as the substance, and this is really a case that shows the procedure was absolutely vital to this case, and because it didn't meet the authorities' test, the warning was as such unjustified. Yeah, how do you weigh up, I guess, the procedure, as you say, versus the supposed wrong potentially in accessing those tax records? How, how do you sort of come to, to weigh those two sides up? It's actually really difficult because mm. you would think the substance would be more important. You would think um, that the reason or, you know, that someone's done something wrong is, is the most important or difficult thing. But actually it's probably at least 50-50 uh, because the, the focus so much is on the process and giving the employee access to all relevant information, carrying out a proper investigation. And of course it's always the process that's the easiest thing to uh, attack or look back on because with hindsight you can always do something that might be better or slightly different once it's all been done. And so the process and any sort of disciplinary process is always the thing that, that is easier for um, advocates or employer, employees on the other side to perhaps attack or challenge. Pretty good lesson for employers there then. Does, I mean, with the removal of that final written warning as well, does this mean she can go back to the workplace or...? Yes, so she, she stayed in the workplace all along because interestingly um, the decision maker in the case said that he still had trust and confidence in her uh, to continue in her role um, to not breach IRD's policies going forward and that is why she only got a final written warning as opposed to being dismissed. So she effectively stayed there uh, throughout. The warning um, gets expunged or removed from her file so it's as if it never happened and of course she's also got the $20,000 for the hurt and humiliation and distress compensation. Let's go on to the next case then as well, involving a woman who took on NIWA. What happened in this one? 
So this was a case um, of Miss Ashby who um, worked for Niwa Vessel Management, so one of its vessels, the, the Tangaroa, and it's a case that goes back its genesis is 13 years ago, so quite a, an old case. In 2009, Miss Ashby raised a complaint of sexual harassment against the then first mate of the vessel. She was a cook, uh, and that complaint was upheld, and that particular um, gentleman got a, a final a written warning. Uh, roll on two years, uh, he was promoted to master of the vessel, so then she was reporting to him again. Things seemed okay until about 2014 when she raised allegations of bullying against uh, the master and she asked to swap shifts, she didn't want to be working on the same shift as him. And um, these bullying allegations uh, were investigated. In the middle of all of that, somehow the general manager of the vessel sent a copy of her complaint to a number of scientists on the vessel, that was her original complaint, so she got quite concerned about all of that and there was also some facilitation between her and the master. She kept asking to move shifts and they kept saying it wasn't possible because the cook on the other shift, he was quite happy where he was, he didn't want to move. The result of the investigation was that he, she hadn't been bullied but that the master could work on his communication style, he was said to be blunt uh, and direct and he could work on that and do some professional development in relation to that. Really interestingly, the investigation report also said there appeared to be incompatibility issues and that she could no longer work with the master and um, Niwa Vessel Management might want to consider terminating her employment for incompatibility. Uh, and ultimately that's what they did. So in 2015 her employment was terminated for incompatibility. Uh, and the test for incompatibility usually has to be where one it's mainly attributable to one person. So they blamed her. They said the whole breakdown in the relationship was her fault. Unfortunately for them, neither the Employment Relations Authority or the Employment Court agreed with their analysis uh, and she was found to be unjustifiably dismissed and she got significant remedies on appeal to the Employment Court. She got 12 months lost wages, which is, which is a significant amount, and she also got $35,000 under the Hurt and Humiliation Compensatory Head, so significant remedies were awarded to her. That terminated for incompatibility sounds like it'd be fairly difficult to assess that, or quite a. Quite it is really difficult. Mm. It's a really difficult um, way of dismissing someone, and doesn't happen particularly often because of that test of almost someone has to be effectively blameworthy or mainly to blame for the breakdown. Um, and the employment court actually said it was it was quite critical and said she was absolutely in no way to be blamed for being sexually harassed, which was effectively the genesis of where things started uh, to go wrong. And Niwa had also commented at the employment court hearing that it had worked on its bullying and harassment and those types of policies and was improving. And the judge said it was particularly disappointing that they continued to blame uh, Ms Ashby when they themselves had said they'd been doing work and, and improvements had been made. So they were quite critical of, of the attempt to blame her for the situation she found herself in. Ashby was awarded more than she claimed for, why? So she originally claimed in the authority for $20,000 uh, hurt humiliation compensation or, and what Niwa tried to argue in the court was that because of a court of appeal case, uh, she couldn't claim more in the court, so she was stuck with the amount that she'd effectively put in her statement of problem. And Judge Holden disagreed with that analysis and said that the Employment Relations Authority is effectively not bound by that, by that Court of Appeal decision. There's no requirement in the Employment Relations Act for an employee to put in the amount of compensation they want. And often you see in statements of problem, the employee just claims lost wages, stop. Hurt humiliation compensation, stop. No amount is put in. And then it's for the authority to assess in all the circumstances what that compensation would be. So the, the judge had no issue with the authority had awarded $20,000 compensation and three months lost remuneration. And the court had no issue with increasing that to 12 months lost remuneration and $35,000 hurt and humiliation compensation. Bronwyn, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.